My next guest is American writer, historian, actor and essayist whose acid wit has made him a hugely popular and indeed unpopular commentator. I like Gore when he's on this show. He says what is on his mind. Mr. Vidal has become a cultural icon. Prolific American novelist, playwright, screenwriter, historian, essayist. Conversationalist, actor, humorist and sometime political candidate. Would you welcome please Mr. Gore Vidal. From We Own This Town, this is Vidalatry. A look at the wit and wisdom in the spoken words of Gore Vidal. I'm Ryan Briegel. Throughout the 1950s, Gore Vidal was best known as an author. As the decade drew to a close, he had over a dozen books to his credit, and his most recent play, A Visit to a Small Planet, was a huge hit on Broadway. Gore traveled in circles of very famous people and had a whirlwind social life in New York City. So the thought of adding the role of politician to his very full schedule seemed unlikely and unnecessary. And then, as 1960 began, he would find success with a new play called The Best Man, about two men running for president and the scandalous secrets that each candidate would dig up to use against the other. So if he could do well writing about politics, why did Gore Vidal have any interest in actually experiencing political life for himself? Did he honestly think he could make a difference in what happened to the United States? Well, he certainly spoke as if he did. Gore appeared on the UK television program Afternoon Plus in 1981, and he very candidly detailed what he has always found to be the main problem with American politics when he was asked if he loved his country. The country? Uh, why, why bother with it if you didn't? You were drawn to that. You were drawn to make it better than it is, but you also find yourself against a vast machine, which includes television, the press, and uh, the various uh, banks that do indeed own the country, in which dissent of any kind is immediately dispelled as quickly as possible. So you have great difficulty in getting to the people. Half of our population Half of our electorate never votes at all. And the other half votes but does not know that we don't have political parties. We have one party which has two wings. One is called Democratic, the other is called Republican. Each is financed by the same oil companies, the same defense industries. And the politicians are interchangeable. And every time we start to have a political party, something goes wrong. In 1912, I think it was, the Socialist Party polled over a million votes. Our one party with two wings got so upset that the noble Woodrow Wilson, the only thing he could think to do was put in jail the head of the Socialist Party under his wartime acts, and that was the end of that party. They act very quickly to get rid of dissent. This is why I'm a figure that does not exactly fill them with joy. Gore speaks here of Eugene Debs, the presidential candidate for the Socialist Party, who did get nearly one million votes in 1912 and was called a traitor to his country by Woodrow Wilson. Debs was imprisoned in 1919 for speeches he made against Wilson and the World War I draft, and was behind bars for two years until his release in 1921. So if everything is stacked against you as a politician, why bother even trying? Gore thought he could make a difference, and at times he felt he had no other choice but to run for office. Also, note how progressive the answer he gives to the next question was, for 1981. Every American boy is told that he could become president. Do now, you still believe you could become president? Uh, every American girl now is also told she can become president. The presidency, I don't think, is anything you really want to have now because the political situation is such that uh, the actual governing of the United States is not done by the president or by the Congress. It's done by the Chase Manhattan Bank, a very important bank, the oil companies, the defense industries, people in boardrooms around the United States. We have a law, really, that the better known you are, the more publicity you get in a country like the United States, the less power you have. Why do you want to be oh, in why politics? Would I be? Well, because I would be, first of all, I'd be the candidate against the Chase Manhattan Bank and the candidate against the oil companies, which means an awful lot of money would be put up to see that I was defeated, and there might be enough put up to affect that. On the other hand, there are ch occasionally you have a chance for a citizen politician to come in. One person isn't going to do much of anything in the United States Senate, but you have a chance to sort of say who's stealing what from whom and try to expose the system from within. And I think it's a useful thing to do. Anyway, I'm 
so, so genetically arranged that I am obliged to be a candidate. It isn't really that uh, it's a thing that you would sanely choose. Anyway, I'm a natural politician, alas. And, uh, then do you think been... you've wasted your life? I haven't wasted my life, but I would like to have been two people. I certainly never wanted to be a writer, but I was born one. Uh, it's just like being, uh, I don't know, being double-jointed or having perfect pitch. It's something that you're born with. You don't necessarily want to do it. As I began to read my first book, I was about six years old, I found myself writing a book the same time I was reading one. So you and were born not on only writing. with a silver spoon in your mouth, but a fountain pen in your right well, baby it wasn't fist. A silver you? spoon. I, I <laughs> think silver tongue is the phrase you're looking for. My family had no money. We were political and connected with just about everybody by marriage, but my end was penniless. So all we had were our wits to live by. You weren't a privileged child. I always thought you were. No, I was privileged in the sense that I was brought up in a family of uh, senators and military people and politicians. And indeed, his family was completely immersed in political life, from his Oklahoma senator grandfather to his connection with the Kennedys. You see, when Gore's mother divorced her second husband, Hugh Auchincloss, and Hugh then married a woman named Janet Bouvier, Gore got to know Janet's daughter, Jackie, and Jackie's husband, a Massachusetts senator who in 1960 was running for president of the United States. John F. Kennedy and Gore Vidal developed a close friendship, but then had a falling out, which we will explore at a later date. But through Kennedy, Gore was a first-hand witness to a man's campaign for president, and what he saw inspired him to first write a play about what goes on behind the scenes and then that same year, it pushed Gore to run for a seat in the House of Representatives. There is no doubt that in 1960, political power was under the skin of Gore Vidal. First, the play. Dreamt up during a Miami lunch Gore and Tennessee Williams had with the Kennedy couple, the best man tells the story of three men. Number one, an honest, ethical, former Secretary of State named William Russell. Number two, a dirty, unscrupulous senator named Joe Cantwell. And number three, a former president named Art Hochstetter, who was trying to decide which of the two men he should endorse. The action takes place during the national convention of an unnamed political party. But what is strange is that unlike now, where the candidate is a foregone conclusion by the time we arrive at the conventions, in 1960, the final nominee was a mystery, and the possibility of an open convention was quite real. Today, primaries decide the nominee well ahead of time, and a convention is nothing more than a televised campaign event. Things were more exciting then, with the feeling that anything was possible. If a candidate didn't get the majority of the votes on the first ballot, the delegates were released and able to switch their allegiance to a different candidate before the next round of voting. And then it's an open convention, which is what happens in The Best Man. Gore discussed the play in the 1978 German documentary, Profile of a Writer. Stendhal once said that politics in a work of art is like a pistol shot at a concert. So I've always tried to keep my political life and my um, literary life somewhat apart. Here Gore paraphrases the 19th century French writer Stendhal. And the actual quote is, Politics in a literary work is like a gunshot in the middle of a concert, something vulgar, and, however, something which is impossible to ignore. Also impossible to ignore? Gore's characters were based on real men. The ethical candidate was two-time presidential hopeful Adlai Stevenson. The scheming senator was current vice president Richard Nixon. Not that Gore tried to hide it. But in 1959, I decided to bring the two together in a play, which was really going to be polemical, about one very bad man who was running for president called Richard Nixon, and another very charming but ineffectual man called Adlai Stevenson, who might very well be his opponent. And I wanted my friend Kennedy to get the nomination, so I wrote a play which ran for a very long time on Broadway and became a film. Uh, Mr. Nixon was not amused at the way I portrayed him on the stage. Wealthy Broadway producer Roger L. Stevens was the man who first pushed Gore to come up with a new play, 
and when Gore gave him the best man, Stevens made sure to find out what Gore's targets thought of it, as he details during an appearance on Theater Talk in 2000. So Roger, unknown to me, sent a copy of the script to Adlai Stevenson, and I saw the letter that Adlai wrote Roger Stevens, and Adlai was waffling around, would he run, wouldn't he run, and he said, um, in the letter, he said, if the Catwell character is based upon Richard the Blackhearted, <laughs> referring to Richard M. Nixon, uh, I am much amused. <laughs> If the other character is based upon me, I am less than satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that you flip it that, and, and you show this hypocrisy of, of the Kent, while your villain, who he seems to be based on Nixon, is he? No, he's not. He's not? All, they're all made up. There are certain archetypes that are mm -hmm. eternal in politics. Mm -hmm. He was thought to be based on Nixon first time around, and the other one thought to be Adlai Stevenson, but I don't work thinly disguised, you know, that's... For, uh, that's for the higher journalism. <laughs> uh, okay. The point is that people are mixtures, and I was doing something very grown up, which they weren't used to. I find it interesting that Ronald Reagan originally auditioned for the role of good guy Russell, but Gore didn't think Reagan was believable as an ethical candidate and chose to cast Melvin Douglas instead. It gave Douglas a renewed career, and rejected Reagan soon became governor of California, for which Gore never forgave himself. And then in 1964, a film of the play was released, just five months after Kennedy was shot. Gore raved about the final product on the BBC's Omnibus in 1995. The Best Man, which was a play of mine that ran for two years on Broadway, opened in 1960, and it's a very good movie about American politics, with Henry Fonda, Lee Tracy, Cliff Robertson. And uh, it's, it was one of the few realistic, satiric plays about American politics. It was directed by Franklin Schaffner, who had so famously filmed Jackie Kennedy giving a tour of the White House two years before. Gore felt that the film was a much-needed change in the kinds of political dramas that had come before it, as he relayed on Theater Talk. The only political drama Americans had had as of 40 years ago, was the dread Frank Capra. <laughs> These great gooey things about Mr. Deeds goes to Washington, which are totally false, horrible stuff. And he, he was going to direct The Best Man, too, as really? a movie. I fired him. <laughs> <laughs> I was asked, I, I, I won the prize uh, for Best Picture at the Cannes Film Festival, the movie of The Best Man in 64. And Gilles Jacob, who was the head of the festival. What was your greatest moment in the movies? Because I used to write quite a few movies. And I said, when I fired Frank Capra. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I did a public service beyond belief. Apparently, Frank Capra wanted Henry Fonda, who plays the good guy Russell, to appear on the floor of the convention dressed as Abraham Lincoln. The logic was that Fonda had played Lincoln in a 1939 film, so the character Fonda played in The Best Man, would also dress as Lincoln? Thankfully, Gore fought to have Schaffner direct instead. In the play and in the film, the good guy Russell is highly promiscuous in his private life, and the bad guy Cantwell threatens to use a nervous breakdown in Russell's past to show he is not medically sound to be president. But then we learn Cantwell may have dabbled in homosexual acts in the army 15 years earlier. Will the two men expose the private lives of each other? And how will that reflect on each as a candidate? Through these two men in The Best Man, Gorse seemed to be making a point that the politician who had slept with lots of people in the past and who might have had homosexual experiences, both good descriptions of himself, should be viewed for his policies and not his personal life. So it came as no surprise in 1960 when Gore Vidal announced he was running for Congress from the 29th District of New York. The campaign slogan, You'll Get More with Gore, was chosen, although Gore never knew exactly what there was supposed to be more of. But one could be sure it would not be more of the same. Gore ran on two main platforms, federal aid to education, which critics said was pro-communist, and a plan to allow graduates who did not want to be drafted to work in a useful capacity all over the country. 
Kennedy would take that idea over as his own, and it became the Peace Corps. Not exactly what Gore had in mind. But he knew the art of politics was more than just issues. Four years later, he spoke with a French journalist about the 1960 election. Inevitably, our society being curiously democratic means that there's enormous tyranny of the mass, which means that people try to avoid real issues in a campaign. We have them. But that our political life is mostly images, how this man smiles, and does that man have a nice wife, and does he seem to be a good father. I'm afraid that our political life tends to become very personal, and I find that dangerous. But possibly the most dangerous was Gore's own personal life being exposed. In the photograph retrospective, Snapshots in History's Glare, Gore recalls an attempt to end his candidacy with an anonymous threat to distribute one million copies of his 1948 novel, The City and the Pillar, throughout the district. Gore reportedly responded that he would consider such a thing if the number was raised to two million, since the book had not been doing as well in recent years. His opponent was the incumbent representative J. Ernest Wharton, who had recently married a woman 15 years younger than he. When asked about his own homosexual past, Gore was tempted to bring up the age gap in Wharton's marriage, but he found the idea of a person's private sex life coming into political play absolutely irrelevant, as he discussed in a 1998 PBS interview on the topic of the Clinton sex scandal, which was in full swing at the time. The sex lives of anybody in politics or anywhere else is of no importance to their execution of their work. So I'm pretty much on his side. There are many, uh, the reason why we get so much sex, first it's an easy smear, but we get so much of it because we are not allowed to discuss politics in the United States. If you want to rise in politics, in office, you talk about other things. And uh, I think when he started in, he, he, he seemed to recognize that the only thing worth talking about for adults in a society like ours allegedly, is who collects what money to spend on whom for what. That in one sentence is what politics is, taxation and expenditures. We can't talk about it because then you have to get into the overruns of General Electric. You have to get into the, uh, the defense budget, which procurement is just as high as ever. If you can't talk about all these things, what have you got left but the sex lives of the candidates? That's part of our problem. On election night, the city votes trickled in first with Gore ahead. But as the less urban areas were heard from, he fell behind. In the end, perhaps it was Gore's public persona that led to his defeat, or perhaps it was his lofty ideals. He would go on to lose by 20,000 votes, which was not so bad in such a heavily Republican district. At any rate, it didn't put Gore off politics forever, because in 1982, he decided to give campaigning another try. And it seemed his only serious competition was the sitting California governor, Jerry Brown. I live now in California, a strange and volatile state, a whole Pacific nation with 22 million people. And we have a governor who is a Zen Buddhist Jesuit. Now, this is practically a resistible combination. And he's called Jerry Brown. And his second uh, go at the governorship, his second term is over. And he wants to go to the United States Senate, and I would like to go to the United States Senate, so we may be, we may be, we have to always say this very carefully, we are both thinking seriously about running in 1982, which is a little over a year away, but you plan early and you run hard. As the 1970s ended, and Gore saw Ronald Reagan elected as president in 1980, he began seriously thinking of running again, this time in the Democratic primary for the U.S. Senate in California. On the Afternoon Plus program, when asked how important it was in politics to be well-known, Gore took the opportunity to ridicule Reagan while emphasizing his own popularity. Do you think your fame would be an advantage if you do stand as senator, or do you think it's almost a, a disadvantage? I, I'd like to use one of your co quotes, which was about another writer and sage, mm -hmm. Marshall McLuhan, when you said everybody thinks they've read him <laughs> because they've read so much about him. <laughs> and I think that probably applies to you, doesn't it? Oh, I'm sure it applies to me. Is it more? Do you think there's a danger in being known for being well-known? I think there is 
in politics, no danger at all in being known for being well known. I have, curiously enough, coming as I do from, I suppose the word is the left, I have exactly the same advantage as a politician that Ronald Reagan had, except that I don't have the money. He was picked by the rulers because the American people had seen him between the movies and television commercials for 50 years. And it was never whether they like him or dislike him. They're used to him. They have been watching me on television for 30 years. I have been part of the national furniture. <laughs> Do they like me or not? That's not important. I'm like, like the chair on your set, you know. <laughs> I've been around forever. So you could almost say anything. I could almost say, yes, I believe we probably should drop a nuclear bomb on Washington. They say, oh, there's Gore again. Isn't that interesting? So nobody pays any attention to you? They, don't, they, they do and they don't. But what does work is that you are they're so used to you. Mm. And in a funny way, I would be the Reagan of the left because he got in really because the rulers wanted somebody, first of all, somebody who could read cue cards for the... So you reckon that the public facade of... Uh, politics is sheer showbiz. I think and it's totally And you'd be marvellous show. at that. I'm perfectly good at that. Because and as co you've content said is not very important, as you know. But Gore seemed to enjoy sprinkling his showbiz with a little content. In 1982, he officially began running in the California primary, and he saw the value of talk show appearances to get his ideas across. For Gore, time was better spent declaring his political platform than promoting his newest book. He showed up on The Tonight Show with his friend Johnny Carson, discussing the current government's obsession with war. Are you, I saw you on a show for one night. It was on, um, I don't know where it was done from. The, the fellow was rather perceptive of an interview. A good show, and he was discussing your uh, possible, your possible entry into the race for Senator of California. And he kept saying, now, Gore, are you really serious? Now, I know you fairly well. We've spent a little time together. So, uh, are, are you serious, or are you just trying to create a little holiday diversion for people and uh, well, make, make it interesting or or what? Well, I think I'm, I'm very serious about the difference between Jerry Brown and me is that uh, he, he's interested in elections and I'm interested in politics. You sort of see Jerry must hang in a sort of in a closet in a blue suit. They take him out in the morning. Hi, I'm Jerry Brown. I'm running for, for president or governor and senator. <laughs> I don't suppose this is good for character. I don't think he gets a chance to think much. So I've been going around the state talking about issues, talking about the uh, real, real subjects like why it is that we're always at war with somebody. Where, where, where did this enemy of the week come from? It's Nicaragua this week. It was Salvador the week before. We were going to overthrow Gaddafi at one point, and the CIA said, no, 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 it wasn't Libya, it was Mauritania. And the Mauritanians then got on the phone, why are you trying to overthrow us? You know, Where does this come from? I would like to see the money that goes to defense. We have quite enough. We are way ahead of the Russians in most things. I'd like to see at least half of that budget go domestically toward education, toward maintaining the cities, toward people. And forget this war against everybody. It never seems to happen, does it? And he stopped by the Merv Griffin show to present his radical views on taxation and religion. And of course, you know, a man of the cloth has as every much has as much right as anybody else to support a political candidate. He has every right to do it on television. He has every right to, to well, get. That's his... not clear. Does he have oh, the right? Oh, sure, he has. Yeah, he a, has... a tax-free institution in America. Well, that's, can... well, this is the point. The separation of church and state. Well, the, we don't separate it quite that much. If he wants to get out and talk that he, if the Reverend Falwell is for Reagan, he can say he's for Reagan. If he wants to get millions of dollars uh, from hustling on television and then use it for politics, he has every right. But he should not be tax exempt. Every religion in the United States is tax exempt. These are the biggest rip-offs, some of them, including the legitimate leg uh, religions right along with uh, the blessed L. Ron Hubbard of Scientology fame and the South Korean Messiah. These people are in business to mint money. So I would say let them pick up as much money as they can and then have a man from the IRS come right in and say, all right, give us our share. They, sh they should no longer be tax exempt. It's been estimated that if you tax all the religions in the United States, the new ones like the Scientology, right on to the Catholics, the Baptists, and the Jews, you could raise a hundred billion dollars a year. Now that's two-thirds of the military budget. That's a lot of money. Since I am ecumenical by nature, I would tax also the great foundations, the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, 
These are all great tax evasions, you know, for the rich. Tax them both. That would pay the last third of the military budget, you know. That would take the heat off of us. Gore also brought up the strange fact that certain issues inexplicably receive more weight than others. These single issue things are quite frightening. I mean, suddenly abortion becomes more, more important than unemployment or inflation. This is kind of crazy. I mean, abortion is an important issue, but inflation touches everybody. And suddenly to uh, get down to a debate, you're going to defeat somebody for Congress because you disagree that he does not believe that the fetus is sacred, and you do. It seems to me very odd indeed. I've always found, though, that the people, the right to lifers, they say, thou shalt not kill, you must never kill a fetus, but they're all in favor of capital punishment. <laughs> I've never understood this. I, I think this is what, in, in theology, we call a divine mystery. You know, how... In the end, out of nine candidates in the primary, Gore came in second behind Jerry Brown. Brown would go on to lose the Senate seat to Republican Pete Wilson, who was strangely on a path to Brown's previous title as governor of California. Many years later, in 2010, Brown would again run for governor of California, a position he won, and in his fourth and final term still holds in 2018. And in the years that followed, Gore Vidal often spoke of political office as something meant for more ordinary people than himself. In a PBS interview from 1994, he lamented Bob Dole's recent political failings. He's certainly one of the brightest people in the Senate, and one of the funniest. He's a very witty man, and uh, I wonder if that stopped him from being president. Because anything you say also, and you mustn't sound too intelligent either, because an intelligent person might think aloud, might ask a question. Well, any journalist can twist that around, you know. You really are in favor of killing, killing the firstborn in order to keep population down, you know. You'll hear it come back at you like that. His longtime friend George McGovern seemed to sum up the conflict within Gore, the man who wanted to make a difference but would never be able to keep his mouth shut long enough to do so. I've watched him uh, handle audiences. I've watched him deal with politicians. He does have a pragmatic quality that I think would have served him well. Uh, obviously, he would have had to discipline his tongue and his pen a little more if he'd been in public office than he has uh, as a writer, an intellectual. But could Gore Vidal have ever disciplined his tongue and his pen? Or was running for office something he tried, knowing he would never really succeed? Perhaps being a candidate was just one of his various personas. And yes, Gore played the part in his own way, but in the end, he knew that being a politician was not really the right role for him, as he wearily yet wittily confesses in Profile of a Writer. Later I discovered that there are not two parties, there is one party, which I call the Property Party, and it owns the United States, and it founded the United States, and our first millionaire, George Washington, was the founder of this republic. So we have one party with two wings, one is called Democratic, one is called Republican. When the, <clears throat> when the Democrats make too big a mistake, then they throw it to the other wing of the party, which is Republican. But the two parties represent no one in the United States at all. They represent only the great interests, the great money, the banks. And this, this, uh, the more reading I did and the more I discovered the history of the United States as I began to write it, the more I realized it was absolutely hopeless, that nothing short of a revolution would change the system, and uh, there is not a revolutionary situation, as they say, in the United States. The closest, I suppose, was the Depression back in the 1920s. So I now realize it is completely pointless. Politics is a very interesting game for people who have no talent and have nothing much to say and wish to advance themselves with a minimum. It's for, it's for very energetic mediocrities. And happily, our supply is practically inexhaustible. But as this was 1978, just four years before he would run in 1982, it looks like Gore Vidal decided to mix with the mediocre one more time. Vidalatry is brought to you by We Own This Town. 
This episode was written and produced by me with additional research by Joshua Reese. You can find more information about this episode at vidolatry.com. I'm Ryan Briegel. Thank you for listening.